Well, good morning, Gold Creek. It's good to be here with you guys. My name is Stevie B. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, so I want to just see, I'm going to ask a couple questions, and if you could just wait until the end of the question before you raise your hand. Uh, who in uh, right now here, whether it's online, of course we won't be able to see you online, whether it's here in person, uh, considers themselves a person in recovery, don't raise your hand. A person, they may have a recovering person in their family, don't raise your hand. Or a, or a person that knows about recovery. Now raise your hand if you're one of those three. Oh, wow. Okay, there's, so there's, there's a good amount of people here. That's awesome. Now for the other half of the room, or really only a quarter of this room, you, the, a lot of people know either someone in recovery or in recovery. I didn't ask who needs to be in recovery because no one's asking you to raise your hand for that. You wouldn't have done it anyway. I'll talk to you afterwards. But... For the other quarter of the room that didn't know anyone in the recovery or doesn't know anything about recovery, I want to share with you on who the first recovering couple was uh, for us here on planet Earth. We're going to go to Genesis 3.1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will surely die. The serpent said, you won't die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced she saw that the tree was beautiful. Sin is always beautiful. She saw that it looked delicious. Sin always looks delicious. And she wanted wisdom from it that you would give her. So she took some of the fruit and she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband. Thanks, sweetheart. Who was with her. And he ate it too. Because guys will usually do, especially when they're newly married, they just had met Eve, Adam and Eve, do anything the woman says. Now, I'm not blaming Eve. I want to tell you, I believe that the moment God said, don't eat it, Adam and Eve wanted to eat it. I have been told many times in my life, don't, and that's when I want to. If you could relate to that, uh, you, you understand me. Now, I want you to know that when they, before they got kicked out of the gar garden, my type of people, Adam type of people, we brought the first juicer underneath the tree and we started juicing immediately and drinking from the tree before we got kicked out. Then as soon as we got kicked out, the first recovery meeting that ever was founded between Adam and Eve, they talked about what happened and how they would get back in God's good graces. The word recovery is, uh, is a return back to the normal state of health that you were once had before. So now that I ask you, before anybody raises their hand, I'm going to ask you one more time. If you've ever suffered from pride, I'm going to give you the seven deadlies. If you've ever suffered from pride, don't raise your hand. Anger, greed, gluttony, envy, lust, or sloth. For those of you who don't know what sloth means, it just means you're lazy. I'm not saying you would be lazy. That's the seventh sin. It's laziness. So now that I've shown you who the first recovering people are and that we really all came from there and I've told you the seven deadly sins, raise your hand if you may feel that you're in recovery now. Yes, you understand what I'm saying. Everybody that loves God or calls God their father or has Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, every day is in recovery. Amen. My name is Stevie B and this is my story. I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank this church. I want to thank this church because this church not only has the greatest worship band that I have heard in recent years. Whoa. Wow. But this church has a heart for recovering people. The pastors of this church, the campuses of this church has a heart for recovering people. They have a heart for, a heart for recovering people because they understand what it was and what it is like to be once lost and then found. 
So they brought myself and my wife here. And I want to tell you a little funny story about that. The first time we spoke was in Woodenville. And Pastor Brian had saw me speak at an AA meeting. And before I even said the first words, he felt that the Lord had told him to come and ask me to share my story at his campus at, 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 uh, in Washington. So he said, would you come up to Washington? And I said, absolutely. I'm from Florida. Uh, excuse me, I live in Florida. I'm from New York. I go up and down the coast all the time to see my parents. I'll make a, a trip of it. I'll stop in Washington, and then I'll see my, my mom and my sister and my dad in Long Island. And then I found out it's Washington State. I said, it's not, no big deal, sweetheart. I'm not saying that I'm ignorant because I wasn't. I love Washington. I said, honey, let's just look and see where Washington State is. I know it's a, it's a little. And then I realized from Miami to Washington, where we're at here, you cannot be further off in the map ever in the whole United States. So um, we're really excited to be here with you guys today. And I, I want to share um, a little bit of my story. I come from a great family. Uh, my parents uh, are, are, are wonderfully successful people. My dad went home to be with the Lord a month and a half ago. Uh, four months ago when I was here, he got to hear my story here. And he, was just, he just loved it. And he's so proud of me. My mom is one of the first women chiropractors in the entire state of New York. So I come from a, yeah, yeah. I come from a, a really good family. They always told me they loved me. I came from a good home, and I want you to know I couldn't feel it. I want you to know that I was always looking for outside things to, feel this, to fill this God-sized problem that I had inside. I thought that one of the reasons that I didn't feel well adjusted to my neighborhood, being from New York, is that everybody on my block, that's the way we do it in New York, everything's separated by blocks, neighborhoods, and everybody in my block, they had big brothers. The Wagamans, the Mundingers, the Woolies, they all had big brothers. And I had a little short, she's watching, so I'm gonna be kind, I had a little short chubby sister. And when you have a little short chubby sister and you walk to the playground, you get no juice for a little chubby, for a little sister. You get no juice for that. The guys that came in with the big brothers, they got picked first. And I felt that if I had a big brother, that that would have changed everything for me. And that's why I felt that I didn't fit in. We had a visiting coach that came to our uh, high school. I don't know if he was visiting or if he was a new coach. And he was reading the roster. And he got to my last name. My last name is Boyarski. And he said, uh, Boyarski, yes, coach, does your brother play for the Pittsburgh Panthers? Now, it's a very simple answer if you don't have a brother, number one. Number two, if you have a brother but he doesn't play for the Pittsburgh Panthers, that's also a very simple answer. And, but at that moment, I saw my entire life was about to change. And before I knew it, the words came out of my mouth and I said, yes, he does. And all my friends that have known me my whole life, they all rushed over to me and said, why did you just tell the new coach that you have a brother that plays for the Pittsburgh Panthers? I said, because yes, he does. I have a brother. And I stood by that, and I got newspaper clippings, and I bought a jersey, and I walked in... I did. I walked in that man's fane all the way until he got drafted into the NFL, which was like the proudest day in my life, to be honest with you. I tell you that story because I wanted to be anybody other than Steve Boyarski. No matter what you said to me about who I was, I didn't feel good about who I was. And nothing from the outside was going to change that. I promise you that the, today's talk is not going to be about drugs and alcohol. Tonight I speak here at 7 o'clock at an AA meeting. It's called the Higher Powered Meeting. This church is so amazing. They have a Higher Powered Meeting every night of the week except for Tuesdays and Saturdays. Tonight at 7 o'clock, if you want to hear the whole story where it gets crazy and I talk about drinking from the fruit and, you know, I, I can't say it because there's kids here, but if you want to come tonight, that's the, the whole talk and that's, that's going to be from 7 to whenever they can drag me off the stage. Here I have some restrictions. It's an hour talk that, Tam, that Cammie said that I need to get done in 25 minutes. So what I want to share with you is just strap in, okay? For the people that are in the front, the spit's going to be flying. By the time I finish all the different stories that I tell you like the movie Pulp Fiction but I'm don't watch the movie I'm just saying it's like a movie that by the end it all comes together I had my first drink when 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 I whenever I did and, and that that's not the start of my story before I had my first drink I wanted to be fit in 
I wanted to be and fit in. I wanted to be a kid that kids wanted to hang out with. The coolest kid in my neighborhood, the toughest kid, his name was Kevin, is Kevin. And he has three monster-sized big brothers. And I really wanted to be like Kevin. And I always wanted to hang out with Kevin. And, um, but he never wanted to hang out with me. The first time when I was alone, my dad was uh, at a funeral and my mom had had a terrible accident. So the first time I was alone in the house during the day with no babysitter, I was 12. And I went to Kevin, I rang the doorbell and I said, would you like to uh, hang out with me? We didn't say that back 40 years. We would say, would you like to play with me? But you can't say that now or you, you get arrested. So I, I'm just going <laughs> to bring it to modern day talk. You know what I mean? It's different these days. So I, I said to him, would you like to hang out with me? And he said, why? Why would I want to hang out with you? And I said, uh, uh, because I have guns. My dad uh, is a Korean War hero. Uh, he fought on Porkchop Hill, uh, may God rest his soul. And we had guns. So I said, well, blow some stuff up. And the guys in here know, um, maybe guys and girls in here know, you, that guns blow stuff up. And that's something fun. And nobody else in my neighborhood had that. I had that. So he said, yeah, he came over the house. And we were blowing stuff up. But after a while, blowing cans up, it gets boring. And he was about to leave. But I didn't want him to leave. See, I, my whole life I was willing to be and do and say anything that I thought would attract you to be in relationship with me because I had no value inside, nor did I know who I was. And if you don't know who you are, you'll fall for anything. And so I said to him, please don't leave. You can shoot at me. Now, when I said that, I meant that we could just shoot at each other. We'll, shoot, we'll play like cowboys and Indians. We'll shoot next to each other. And a one in a million shot, uh, he shot me right in my eye. It's not his fault. He's 13. I'm 12. It was just two kids. But he shot at me. I lost my eye. While I was laying on that grass, covered in blood, the only thing I could think about was how he would feel if it got out that he was the one that shot me. That's how low self-esteem that I had. Now, when I took my first drink, the first drink was great. I'm a guy that likes drink. I told you that my ancestors were in the original sin garden. Those are my people. We sucked drink down. So when I had my first drink, when I, after that, I liked it. And I know there's other people in here that like sin. I'm not alone in here. There's, just because I'm in recovery or I have an addiction situation. Everybody in here, whether it's Amazon. I know that's from here. I'm not putting down Amazon. Whether it's, whether it's uh, candy or whether it's pizza. When we, when we try something once and we like it, we don't want to not try it again. Otherwise, pizza places would go out of business and Amazon wouldn't be with that. You know, we like something, we do it again. And when I tried alcohol... Uh, at 12, 13, 14, like that. And then I tried um, uh, smoking alcohol. You know what I mean. Um, I think it's legal here, though. So you know, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, I liked it. I liked it. And, and I didn't want to stop. And then I went off to college, and I did other stuff that you do in the 80s. And um, uh, fill in the blanks. Like I said, if you want the whole version, you come tonight, and it's going to get raw. And, 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 and the problems continued to mount. And then by the time I was 21, I went home and told my family that I had a problem, uh, which they were shocked. A little cute story that I didn't tell you earlier, Kim, is that um, in Pennsylvania where I was going to school, and I think you may have that situation here, but I'll, I'll share with you. I don't know if you do. We have a lot of deer in Pennsylvania. And one time I did hit a deer, and it took out the side of my car. And then I told uh, my parents that... I needed money for a car, and they sent the money because of the deer. And then subsequently, uh, during my drug addiction, I was hitting a car, I was hitting a deer every single weekend. And, and my parents, when I finally came home and told them I was a drug addict, they said, thank God, we just thought you had a mental problem that you continued to destroy the deer in the Pocono. <laughs> so I went to treatment when I was 21. The first step in recovery, the first step in any relationship uh, that has to do with something greater than yourself is you, you have to know that you need that relationship. The first step in recovery is that you need to admit that you are powerless. And when I went to this recovery center, it's called a treatment center, I was not able to admit that I was powerless. So I, I got there, I'm 21, I'm from New York, I'm in the middle of the United States, it was, in, it was in Minnesota, my first time west of Pennsylvania, you know, very, very cool, and then, and then extremely cool because it was in the middle of the winter, I'd never seen anything like that. 
the, the, the cold weather that's in Minnesota is, is change your entire life. And, and I got there, and I was, I was woefully underdressed. I had, like, a shirt like this. I had, like, um, like workout pants on, five gold chains. I had uh, some hair gel, and I, I just was not prepared for the whole experience of negative 72. And so when I got there, I wasn't ready to stop. Uh, but, but this is what I want to share with you. It, it, it has nothing to do with stopping or starting. It has to do with this God-sized hole that we all have inside of us and that we're going to stuff stuff in there. You're going to worship something. Everybody in here is going to worship something, right, Kirk? I worshiped uh, drugs and alcohol and everything that came along with it, but, but mo most people in here are, are not doing that, but, but you are worshiping something. Right now, during this hour, hour and a half, could be two and a half hours, um, we, <laughs> just joking, we are worshiping the Lord, hopefully, uh, but we're going to worship something. So I, I started worshiping drugs and alcohol. I stayed sober all my 20s, um, but I didn't have a relationship with God. I had a relationship with a higher power. I had a relationship with a power greater than myself, but I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I didn't have a personal relationship with God. I, I, my God was, was a loving God, but it was, it was like a God that I had like created. It was, it was a higher power. And so I continued to get sicker and, and, and more unstable inside the 12-step programs. While I was in the 12-step programs, um, I, I was supposed to be doing work on myself. I spent a lot of time doing work on the outside of myself, building up the outside, the money, muscles, the hair gel. I still have the hair gel. But all, all that kind of stuff. And I, and I, was, and I was starting to get uh, uh, more intensely upset with the whole situation of planet Earth. Restless, irritable, and discontent. I didn't know anything about that God had good news for me. I worked in a mall where we had a full circus. Elephants, back in those days you could have elephants. Uh, tigers, showgirls, and that's why I saw her. She came in on an elephant. She had beautiful feathers from Las Vegas, and she was just magnificent. She was riding around on the elephants, and I said, if I can get that girl, that's gonna fix what's inside. Because I can't, I'm not drinking. I'm not doing outside stuff. But if I get that girl, everything's going to be okay. And I pursued her. Back then, the stalking laws were a little bit different, so I could pursue her a little bit more intensely. She finally, she finally gave in, and she married me. And I was about five years sober, and my wife is from the beautiful country of Colombia, South America. So she didn't know the United States very well. And my parents gave us a gift to go to any place in the United States, so I told her we would go to New Orleans. If you know anything about New Orleans, I told her it was the home of jazz. She loved that. For really, I knew it was the home of debauchery. I knew there would be drinking and gambling and anything else that I could sneak in while we were there. And while we were there, we were at, our, we were at dinner for the first time. And in the table next to us, now keep in mind I'm five years without alcohol. In the table next to us, the people were drinking fine wine that needed to breathe first. And I never seen that. You guys know this is wine country. You know about wine that needs to breathe first. I never heard of that. The wine that I ever drank didn't need to breathe. It, we just unscrewed and we drank it. <laughs> and once I found out there was wine that needs to breathe first, I knew that I would be drinking again someday. But I would never do drugs again, but I would drink fine wine that needed to breathe first. And for the next two years, I, I, until I was seven years sober, that's all I could think about, to find fine wine. But you really have to know what you're doing. I was 30. I, I never met fine wine that needed to breathe first. I, I went looking for it at 5 p.m. in the afternoon. I, I couldn't find it, so I, I wound up getting some Japanese rice wine in a box. Anyway, after that, all the yets that I hadn't experienced before, um, they started to happen. My beautiful wife, who had married sober Steve, uh, uh, in the program Steve, a guy that didn't drink, now I was drinking. And she didn't sign up for that. So after about a year and a half of just a horrible, horrible run uh, back home, uh, she had to ask me to leave. She asked me to leave with the help of the local police department. She uh, filed a restraining order against me. And you don't, you don't need to know what that is. You just need to know not to get a restraining order. You don't even know what it is. But it just, it's something that you don't want to have following you. And so the police came and they happily escorted me to a halfway house, which another thing you don't want to do, especially if you live in a full house, you don't want to go to a half house. 
And so the whole thing was unraveling before me. And now I was living with my wife and now I'm living with four guys with their feet and I was not happy. <laughs> but I, I really couldn't stop using. My wife had heard about this church and um, she had said to me, I'm going to come pick you up at 7.30 in the morning on a Sunday. Now, I really didn't know what would go on at 7.30 in the morning on a Sunday. I really, truthfully, I'm not making up a story. I, I didn't know. But all I could think about was that if she was picking me up 7.30 on a Sunday, it looked good that I was going home to our full house on that Sunday. So I had all my bags packed, and I had them at the door, and she came and picked me up 7.30, and I showed her the bags. She said, I don't know why you have your bags packed. You could just leave those there. We're going to church. Whoa. But I didn't care. I was going to do anything that I needed to do to get back in the big bed and get back in the house. So she brought me to a church, and it was nothing like I had ever seen. I'm, I'm half Jewish, half Catholic, and she brought me to a church that looked like this. It didn't have any of the people that I was. There was nobody in outfits. There was nobody with crucifixes. There was no holy water. There was nothing going on that I had ever recognized. But she was going in, so I followed her. She started to pray, and I put my hands like this, and she put her hands like this, and I had never put my hands like this any other time that the police told me to put my hands like this. So I put my hands up. I, I, I was going to do whatever it needed to do to get back home. And, and she uh, was, went up to the front of the altar, and she gave her life to Jesus. I followed her, and I was going to give my life to whoever was up there uh, as long as she was doing it. So I followed her up, and I followed her back, and she put her hands in her head, and she was crying, and I said, this is an amazing experience, and she took me back to the halfway house, and I said, I'll be right out. She said, for what? I said, aren't we going home? She said, no, and I, did, I figured this religious stuff doesn't work. The hole kept getting deeper, and I wasn't drinking again. The hole kept getting deeper, and I wasn't drugging again. The hole kept getting deeper, and she came, and she picked me up on that next Sunday. And she brought me back to this box church, very similar to this. None of the stuff I recognized. People greeted me at the door. I didn't want to be there. And then something happened inside the service. And the worship music came on and the song, you changed me, you changed me. And it was like the Holy Spirit had, had got me up out of the seat. And... I just want to share something with you. 20 years ago yesterday, 9-11, I told you I'm from New York. I have friends that died in the towers. One real good friend by the name of Jill. I'm sitting in my house watching the screens. First of all, thank you for your service. Thank you for the first responders in here for your service. Thank you for what you do on a daily basis, and thank you for serving our country. And as I'm watching the towers go down, I was so polluted with drugs and alcohol. My sister called me and she said, we just lost Jill. And this is what I said, where is she? She said, the towers just came down. And I was watching it. And I was so almost gone that I was not able to receive that. 20 years later, let me tell you what God can if you let him. I go up to the front of this church and the pastor says, would you like to exchange your old life for a new one? Would you like your sins forgiven? And I said this amazing prayer and I asked Jesus into my heart. And on the way back, I wasn't looking at my wife. On the way back to the seat, I was crying myself. And because my language, being from New York, and the way that we talk is with four-letter words for everything, it's not offensive. It's just the way we talk. It's, you can't order a pizza pizza from my neighborhood, and you go to the pizza place. If you don't curse, you don't get served. That's just the way that it is. On the way back to my seat, I went to use an expletive type of curse word to tell her how amazing this experience was. And when I went to say it, the words didn't come out of my mouth anymore. I didn't curse anymore. God had struck my mouth clean. Is that amazing story right there? Yeah. <laughs> I 
I, I do want to just, uh, full disclosure, uh, it's not like I'm, I'm perfect, it's not like I'm not made of flesh. When I am uh, putting up something in the house and I go to hang a picture and I hit my thumb, it's not like the first words that come out of my mouth is praise the Lord. I just want to tell you that. <laughs> but other than when I'm totally in my flesh, for 20 years, I can count the number of times I've cursed in a, in a seriously derogatory way. That's a miracle. That is a miracle. But that's just a, one of the incredible miracles, the, the thousands if not millions of miracles that from 20 years ago yesterday, I tried to take my own life to 20 years later, I'm speaking to you in a church from a, from a stage pulpit to tell you that God can. You see, I want to share with you, we're, we're in the book of Isaiah, we're, we're in the good news series. This is what I want to share with you. The good news is this, that God came to rescue us. That's the end of the story. The back of the book is God wins. Now give the Lord a round of applause there. God wins. You know, I got to tell you, from up here, some of you guys are very funny. You're like this. I just told you the end of the story is you're not going to hell. And you're like, it's okay. It's all right. That's fine. But I want to tell you, God wins. And it's just so incredible. I feel so uh, blessed to be here. The first couple of years were so amazing. My wife invites me back into the house at about 11 months. When I came back into the house, I had this idea to turn the mattress over. And because my side of the bed, I felt, was, was needed to be turned over. She had been sleeping there for a year on the other side of the bed. And when I did, there was my stash. Now, I'm not going to get into what that means. I'm just going to tell you there was, there was alcohol stuff in between uh, the two mattresses that I had not remembered. I had put it there in something called a blackout. When you're drunk, you don't remember where you put stuff. I know it's very graphic, but I need to tell you that when I saw that for the first time in my life, because any other time I saw alcohol, I drank it. But because I had just gotten up off my knees and I had just talked to the Lord and I had just told the Lord how grateful I was that he brought me home to my house, I had just said thank you for the first time in my life. It wasn't Steve and the alcohol. It was God, Steve, and the alcohol. And with God, all things are possible. I mean, God, all things are possible. And... Uh, this is a very quiet section in the back. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start calling you guys out. That whole section there is not doing anything. That whole section there. If we could just get some cameras on that section, the back section, they're not doing anything. Yeah. You know, there's a famous story about miners. Um, they went and uh, gold miners, and they had found this incredible gold vein. And they had been there with about 30 of their people. And when they found this gold, they said to their people, listen, we got to go back into town. We have to get equipment so that we can excavate this. But nobody can tell anybody because if we do that, they'll get here before we do and they'll steal this gold. And we also have to go back into town to register it. So nobody say a word. When they, had come, when they had come back to the gold vein, there was already people there. They said to the people, how did you guys know that we had discovered gold? They said, we saw it in your eyes when you were in town. You guys didn't say a word, but we saw that you were excited through your eyes. I don't know if you could see my eyes from up here or my eye, but I am very excited to tell you what God can do. About eight years into our marriage, we wanted to have a baby, and uh, we planned it. We, we built the baby room, and, and it was just, just a great time in our lives. And uh, we couldn't get pregnant. So we, we tried a bunch of different processes in vitro, and that didn't work. And then we had a beautiful uh, a family member donate eggs for, for my wife for South America, from South America, and that didn't work. And then we hired a surrogate, and that didn't work. Nothing was working for us, and then we finally got pregnant. And we were walking around on air, and just it was the greatest days. You guys know how it is. You certainly know how it is. Praise God. Congratulations on your beautiful baby dedication today. That was incredible. And uh, we went to get the tape, uh, you know, the CD and, and of the heartbeat. And, and the, the uh, nurse came in. And she said, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Boyarski, uh, we lost the baby. And, and I, I couldn't understand what she was saying because I had been serving God for eight years. I had... Uh, 
to, you know, toiled in the, in the, with, with sponsees, with guys that I was helping. I was in full-time ministry at this point. I, I just couldn't understand. And I said, I said there, check it again, check it again. And she said, I'm sorry, these things happen. And we left there brokenhearted, and we were crying, and, and uh, some well-meaning people told me, Kirk, they told me that uh, God only gives you what you can handle, which is not true. I said, it's, it's almost a terrible thing to say to someone that God only gives you what you can handle. Because, because then you say, well, what do you mean? God thinks that I can handle a baby dying? No. Terrible things happen sometimes. And God will give you the strength to get through it. Yeah, yeah. And the incredible thing about uh, this series that we're in is we're, we're in difficult times now. Uh, four months ago when I came here, the, uh, we thought COVID was over. And we were zipping in doo-dah and zipping in A. And, 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 and then I came back four months later, and you guys are all masked up. It, 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 COVID's back. And, and we have uh, horrible things going on in Afghanistan and in, and in Haiti and, 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 and all over. But the good news doesn't change. Good news doesn't change in Isaiah, in Isaiah 61 uh, that we'll get to in a little bit. That God has come to set us free. I want you to know that even though I, we received bad news, God still had this incredible plan. And even though our hearts were broken and even though every time we passed the baby room, we were brokenhearted, um, a friend of mine uh, said, uh, why don't you try adoption? And, we, and, we, and we, we tried adoption, but we got kicked out of the adoption. We, we got asked to leave the adoption. You say, I'm sorry. I don't want to say kicked out. That's very wrong. They ask you to leave strongly. It's almost like getting kicked out. And, and so we, we got asked to leave strongly because I was such a great guy in my previous sobriety before I met my wife that I had a felony. We got asked. So now we have a baby room built. We can't have a baby. We just lost our child. And now we can't adopt. And we're brokenhearted. And a friend told me about this beautiful Jewish woman by the name of Mindy that could maybe come to the house and do a home study for us. And she came to the house and she saw a giant picture of Jesus on the wall. And I'm freaking out because I know she's Jewish. I'm like, Gee, this is good. I go, Sandy, we should probably take giant Jesus down and put him in the closet. And, and she says, we're not going to change who we are. And, ta and, and, and uh, Mindy looks up at the, at the picture and she says, Does, do you think God gave you another chance? And I said, I know he did. She said, so I, how could I not give you another chance? And the miracle of it is that someone from the top of the United States in this area called us in South Florida and invited us to come up and adopt their baby. And she said when she was holding this beautiful white, what, hold on, white, <laughs> white baby. Because I got to tell you, you guys make some really white, white babies in this area. <laughs> Some of the best white, white babies come from this area. You grow them. And she's holding up this little baby. And she says, what would you like to name your son? And we said, Joshua. She said, why Joshua? We said, because Joshua 24, 15 says, for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. And I want you to know that your baby, our baby, is going to grow up in a godly home. And we took Joshua home. And there was members of the church and the 12-step programs on our lawn with signs. And they welcomed us home. And we had this beautiful little baby. And for seven months, he didn't have a stitch of hair. <laughs> and at seven months, he sprung out the most beautiful red hair. <laughs> and he looks exactly like my mom. That was God's cherry on the Sunday of this story. And God wants to put a cherry on the Sunday of your story. He gave us a son that doesn't look anything like us. <laughs> and looks exactly like my mom. And he looks exactly like his cousins. And he has the same little freckles as his cousins. And that was God's signature on his beautiful little nose. His beautiful freckles. And when he takes a picture with his three other cousins, the four of them look like they were just created in the same litter. God is in the business of restoration. God loves us so much that the moment we sinned in the garden, that he worked out with his son that he was going to come here to planet earth and he was going to die for us 
to recover us. For he loved us so much that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. But not to condemn us. To save us. In just a few moments, you're going to have an opportunity to come up to the front here. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. For some of you, it's going to be the first time ever. You've been sitting on the sidelines forever. You've been coming to church. You don't receive Jesus. You don't ask Jesus into your heart. You are tired of even listening to, I mean, you got one of the greatest pastors in the United States. You can't even stand him. You're like, look, Pastor there. The title of this message today is Don't Settle for the Crouton. If you are in this life in planet Earth and you're looking at all the bad news and you're still miserable when you come to church and Monday through Friday is a toil for you, it's like, what am I doing here? It's like going to a buffet and going to the salad section and grabbing a plate and a fork and a knife and bringing a crouton out and eating a crouton and you're like, a same day, S-S-D-D. More bad news, turn on the thing. I'm little baby, baby, did. And you're eating your crouton and God wants to give you an abundant, amazing, fruitful, incredible life where you just cannot wait to get to the next thing that you're about to do before you go to heaven. But you're going to have to get up out of your seat. As a matter of fact, everybody stand up. Just stand up. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to ask the... Thank you. Hi. You're going to have to make a first step. We call it the first step. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to come up here. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. The prayer is going to be very simple. It's going to ask Jesus to come into your heart for to forgive you of your sins so that you can exchange your old life for a new life. Amen. 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 So well spoken, and that's serious. For some of you, you're going to come up and you're going to rededicate because you've been sitting on the sidelines so long. You've been eating your crouton and you think that this is all that this planet Earth is, is is crouton time. And you're going to have an opportunity to get back into the game of Jesus today. Of being with the Creator. Of being used for His glory. Those of you that are going to come up here today, whether it's online or in the front, are going to be able to rededicate today. And then some of you just need a healing. Your body's aching, your mind is aching, your spirit is aching, your soul is aching, and you just going to come up here and you're going to ask Jesus today in a fresh way on the 12th of September, and you're going to ask Him in your heart, and you're going to go back to your seats, and something that's going to change... But what I want you to know is it all starts with the first step. Whether it's the first time asking Jesus or rededicating or for healing, I'm going to ask you to come up right now. Come up to the front right now, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and it's going to change your life now, and it's going to change your destiny. Let's give them a round of applause. Yes. I'm going to ask you to come up right now. I'm going to ask you to come up and get back into what God has intended you to have, which is an abundant life. Not a life on the sidelines. Not a life as you watch other people enjoy it. Not a life that was meant worth living. If you're online today, I want to say to you, you can do this right in your homes, and you can ask Jesus into your heart. Is there anybody else that just knows the Lord is, the the Holy Spirit is telling them, it's not that you're not saved. I'm not saying that. You're just not being used. You're not being used because you've been doing church and playing church so long that you forgot why you're even coming here. Come on up to the front and get back into your destiny. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Is there anybody on this side that would like to come up and say on the 12th of September 2021, I rededicated my life and things began to change for me? Come on up. Yes. 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 Yes, brother. Let's all bow our heads. You guys repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came and died for me. I repent of my sins. Please forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. I've decided this day I've decided this day to follow you. No longer living for myself, but living for you. Please give me the power of your Holy Spirit to walk out my destiny here with you. I love you, Jesus, and I pray this in your name. Amen. Before anybody claps, I want you to know something. This is so important. The Bible says that in heaven there's 10,000 angels right now, right now, that are cheering and rejoicing, are cheering with your names on it. 10,000 angels in heaven right now with your name right now are rejoicing because you came up here. Rejoice in because you rededicated there. Rejoice in because God wants to do an amazing blessing in your life. Isaiah 61 says, God came to set the captives free. If today you dedicated your life for the first time, after you see the, uh, the prayer partners, the pastors on the side here, I'm going to ask you just to text, I'm in so that they know how to get in touch with you, to come alongside you, to support you in your decision. Next week, to show the Lord and for yourself that your level of commitment and that you want this whole thing, we have baptisms being done here next week. You can text the word baptism. I don't know how the whole text thing works, but it sounds amazing. And you would sign up for baptism. I want you to know something. September 12th, 2021 is your day. This is the day that everything changes for you. Not only will God can, God will. Not only God can, God will. Father God, Lord Jesus, I just thank you for the dedications today, the rededications. I thank you, Lord, for this amazing church that you have totally filled with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray over the week, I pray over that everyone that made a decision here today, Lord, that the enemy would have no power in trying to distract them or discourage them, and that they would have friends and family that will come around him and then come around them and support their decision. We thank you, Father, that you loved us so much that you sent us your only son, that whoever believed in him will have eternal life. We thank you, Jesus. We pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. Would you guys go right over here and then some prayer partners just want to have a talk with you, and I'll be here and I'll talk with you right afterwards, please. Okay, great. Can we give these guys a round of applause? I want to say one more thing. You guys are not alone. You have all the support that you need in this church. This is service. 
And this is where we get fed. Get into small groups. There's groups for everyone in here. There's even a group for people that don't like groups. <laughs> we have a higher powered meeting every night of the week except for Tuesdays and Saturdays. We have small groups during the week. Let them know that you're new at the church. Text, I'm new. Text them, I'm in. If you just made a decision, that'll mean you're new. Text them, baptism, if you want to get baptism. Just text the word text if you just want to text. This is such an amazing church. God bless you guys. I look forward to seeing you again.